Hi, and you're very welcome back to episode seven of the Women's National League podcast here on FinalWhistle.ie. My name is Brefney Early, and no, that's not Stephanie Roach to the left-hand side of the screen as you're looking at us here on YouTube. Uh, Stephanie, not available this week because she has the small minor matter of becoming the first woman to commentate on a Champions League quarterfinal in Irish television. She was obviously on with uh, George Hamilton on Tuesday night. Congratulations to her. She'll be back with us next week. But we decided we had to get someone who fitted the profile. So we've looked for a blonde Irish international with maybe a half century of caps. It's played at the highest level in the club. And of course, there's one in every street corner in the country. And we picked up Maeve de Burke for the week. Maeve, you're very welcome to the show. Oh, hi, Brefni. Thanks. Great to be here. That was some intro, but big boots to fill, uh, with Steph's boots to fill, but sure, we'll give it a go for one week only. Absolutely. Well, of course, uh, that's very disingenuous to you because uh, having 50 international caps is not something that's every day common across the country. Um, it's great to have you. Obviously, we go back a long way, back to probably the World University Games or even a couple of club encounters through the noughties. Uh, it feels like forever, though. How's life with you not playing this year? Um, talk to us maybe about that decision first and tell us a little bit about about uh, that before we kind of take a little bit of a, a dive back into your, your own history in Galway and further afield. Yeah, as I said there, I'm taking a break this year um, with Galway. I decided just to to take a, a while. I suppose last year I had intended to take a break um, to go traveling and that didn't work out because of COVID. So I think I've kind of um, deferred that break until this year and um, obviously still supporting the girls that uh, fall in every game, but um, just thought it was the time was right to, to take a break. The, the body was telling me as well I needed a little break, so I um, couldn't kind of ignore it. Absolutely. Now, in terms of, I suppose, the international career, we did mention those half century caps. 52, I think, is the uh, appropriate number, uh, despite what Wikipedia might tell you. They might have left you one or two shy on that. Um, let's talk about the week that's that was before we kind of maybe take a look at your own career in the green jersey and, and with Galway Women's FC. Big weekend for Vera Pau on her side. Their first opportunity to maybe get a look at the squad players, the girls who haven't been featuring so far in the competitive games, her first set of friendlies, Belgium and Denmark over the course of the last two weeks. Uh, two fairly tight games, 1-0 defeats in both, but I think a lot of really positive things to take from those games. What were your thoughts on the on the two games as you saw them? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it was disappointing, I suppose, to concede early in both of the games. Um, I think had it not conceded early, maybe we might have seen different results. But um, like you said there, it was great to see um, a lot of the squad players get a run out because in fairness to Vera, she didn't really get a chance. It's difficult to throw players in um, in competitive games, you know, when they when she hasn't seen them play in an international match before. So, um, yeah, the first game um, against Denmark, I think Denmark were, were very good. They um, you know, they had some quality players, but I think, um, you know, overall Ireland put in good performance. Um, I do think, I think yeah, like um, we previously were saying that Emily Whelan really stood out. I thought she made a massive difference when she came on. Uh, I hadn't seen much of her, you know, particularly on international level. So um, I think she really kind of, um, you know, brought a lot of intensity to the Irish attack. Yeah, I've seen her play a few times under 17 levels for Shells and she's always stood out, but to see her do it to teams that are 15, 16 places higher up the rankings than Ireland at international level at, with so few caps in her in her locker, um, huge, huge talent coming forward, I think. And I think we're going to see more of that coming through as the technicality maybe of the younger girls coming into the Women's National League gets better and better and some of these girls go get more experience at senior level here and abroad. Um, in terms of the games, maybe let's take a, a bit of a, a look back at the first game, which of course was uh, the home game against Denmark. Uh, disappointing, I think Denmark looked dangerous from the off, but then when they scored, Ireland seemed to nearly grow into it a bit more. It was kind of weird because normally you score the first goal, you go on to score another couple of chances, but Ireland after starting maybe a little bit poorly and coughing up a couple of opportunities to Denmark, they really did tighten it down at the back. Yeah, they did. In fairness, um, I suppose with five at the back as well, it does give them a bit more stability um, at the back. The only obviously downside to that is, you know, that maybe the wing backs didn't get forward quite as much as um, they would have hoped or, you know, um, it would have looked, I suppose, a bit more of an attacking style had they done that. But um, like I said, they did really grow into the game. Um, and Katie hit the crossbar, if I'm not mistaken, in that game. So they really, they did have opportunities um I know Grace had to, to pull off a couple of saves as well late on in the game, but 
Um, like I said, they did they did take it to to Denmark, and they kind of uh, they seem to be pressing a lot higher than we had seen, um, you know, previously. So um, definitely a lot of positive signs uh, from that game. Yeah, and then of course that brought us to the the trip to Belgium. Obviously, all international travel, as you know yourself from your own personal life over the last twelve months, uh, has been affected. We did manage to get to Belgium for the game uh, over the weekend. A much better performance maybe from the Irish. I thought we offered a bit more in an attacking sense and the two wing backs really did come into it a little bit more than they had done possibly in the first game. Katie uh, McCabe, I thought, had a couple of balls in that were just absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, she did. In fairness, uh, I think that role really suits her. Um, she just played at Arsenal, so I suppose they, that's what they were looking at, trying to implement that system. Um, yeah, they did. They had a lot of uh, opportunities. Um, I think Rouge's free kick uh, was just brought out a really good save out of the keeper. It was so well struck. I think they're, they're um, I suppose they'd be disappointed like to concede from set piece. That's always um, disappointing when you do that. But um, again, I suppose maybe it's an area that can be more easily fixed than if you're conceding open goals, um, you know, through open play. I mean, so yeah, it was definitely um, a lot of positive signs. But I suppose at the end of the day, I still two losses and um you know just seems to be just that um you know that final third just getting the ball in the net which is obviously one of the most difficult things to do but um you know we're definitely there thereabouts um coming up to the qualifiers is it important to be playing teams better than us because i think in the past maybe we've played teams around the same level and got what feel like good results but maybe aren't actually what's best for the team in the long run the fact that we're playing and we're it's the same with the men's team because we're playing teams of a higher standard and we might be losing and we're not used to that as an irish football and fraternity but is it better to be playing at that higher standard and testing ourselves at teams who are where we want to be maybe in a couple of campaigns down the line yeah that's it exactly i mean better to be playing these teams than to be playing teams that you'd be hammering and, you know, um, may give you a false sense of confidence, at least um, it's kind of reality of, of where we're at at the moment when they are, um, you know, playing these teams that, like I said, are ranked above us and are where we want to be. Um, but yeah, it's just, I suppose, it's, it's about trying to get that those final pieces in. Like we have been so close for years. I remember way back, I think it was a good few years now, we nearly beat Germany. I think Steph actually got an equaliser in the 88th minute, but um you know like that we still ended up losing and unfortunately kind of moral victories just don't get your qualification so i think it's just a um, matter of like i said just trying to piece it all together now ahead of the qualifiers and you know if we can just find the goal score in touch i think um you know we'll be very close to it absolutely anyone impress you that maybe you're a little bit surprised by any of the younger girls coming through that you might not have known that much about uh catch your eye i know we mentioned emily wheel and off air and of course you brought her name up there a few minutes ago but in terms of the players going forward most of the squad got at least an hour which is fantastic to see them over the two games but uh, anyone catch your attention yeah it was, it was great to see i think um particularly the girls well in the league at home um you know getting some game time because i would have only seen them at club level really um, the likes of uh, Jamie Finn, I know she had played, played, played previously, but she had a good, I thought she had a good game in the first game. And um, I thought Claire Walsh, um, in particular at the back in the second game, she didn't look out of place at all. And as a defender, that's what you want. She really, I thought she she was very impressive um, against Belgium. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, there's lots of positive signs just to show that you can really, you can just, you have the depth now in the squad that maybe, um, you know, weren't, I suppose Vera maybe wasn't aware that she had nearly because just how, how limited her time was with the squad. So I think that's, um, you know, it's a really, really good sign. And um, to show that I suppose the girls at home can compete as well at that level is it's a good thing. Great to see a new striker as well came out of nowhere. Louise Quinn playing up front in the two games. That's definitely uh, something having worked with her in, in previous squads a, a decade ago. Um, I don't think I ever saw her as a striker. Um, it was news for me. <laughs> What did you think? Have you seen her in five sides of international training before where she's been banging them in or was that just something out of left field that maybe Vera was trying something a little bit Yeah, different? I can't say, um, you know, I haven't played with Louise even at club level as well. I can't say I saw that coming. Um, I've seen her, you know, I think back in the day with P-Mount, she would have played as a midfielder. But yeah, a striker is definitely a new thing. But in fairness to her, she got her head on a couple of flick-ons there later on. So I can see how, you know, particularly... Um, if you're chasing a game you know it's an option and i suppose it's a good option to have there you know she really does um 
win win so many headers. So I think it's kind of um, it's a good weapon to have uh, late on in games. I'm not too sure about from the first minute, but definitely um, coming towards the end of a game, I think she could actually have an impact up there. Yeah, I haven't had both of them in the same squad maybe a decade or so ago with the Leinster Colleges to see Onyo Roman and Louise Quinn coming on, one going to the back, one going up front. It definitely would have been the other way around 10 years ago, uh, which is a little bit mind-blowing for me, but that's the way it is, I suppose, at this moment in time. Uh, some very promising points from that. In terms of your own career, though, I suppose you've had 50-odd caps, as we mentioned, in the green of Ireland. Are you excited by what's ahead of this squad? Because I suppose we're looking north of the border, Northern Ireland sealed a, a really impressive qualification this week. And I'm going to say it against opposition that knocked us out of the European Championships. How much of that is, is something that maybe we should be looking at and, and looking at maybe uh, how we can get to that level? Because we, we, we seem to have dropped behind the north in the rankings, which is something that's very recent. Yeah, it is. And I mean, it's um, obviously it's great um, for Northern Ireland. It's, it's such a fantastic achievement, really, when you, when you think about it, like the, the population they have and, you know, the, the limited, I suppose, players they would have had, particularly in the past. But they, they really have seemed to overtake us as such. Um, I remember playing in various different, like, um, you know, the Istria Cup or Cyprus Cups where they wouldn't have, have fared as well, like in those tournaments, but they really seem to have come on. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's something that we we need to look at and you know try to emulate as well. Like, but um, you know, at times you think we're progressing, then also at times it's it's you just it's worrying when I suppose back in the day there was um, I suppose they used to have like uh, scholarships, for example, say in two thousand six the FEI launched scholarships for like girls at third level in Ireland, and I saw recently there there. They're um, promoting it to, you know, that's the fact that you can play both international and play at third level here. But I think they may need to, you know, back it up with a bit of an incentive for the girls um, to stay at home and to, to get their education as well. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just, I suppose, um, you know, even just the fact of, I think they were talking now about training with boys. But again, like that doesn't seem to be a new concept. I think that's like we were training with boys 15 years ago. And, you know, when you wonder now, like, has there been progression in those sort of areas i suppose uh, on the pitch we can see it and it is there is like even from like we we're saying during the week the games there's definitely a lot of positives but i think we can learn from the types of countries like like the north who have um and scotland actually as well previously they you know they qualified uh, for the first tournament recently enough as well so um you know we're not we're not that far off and i think we're we're very close to it so um you know i think we just need to i suppose just put those little things in place um, to try to just get get over the line and finally get to a major tournament. In terms of your own career, I suppose you played in World Student Games, which is probably as close as any Irish teams have come to that World Cup experience, that major tournament experience. How disappointing was it to maybe not make that step yourself in your own playing career? Yeah, it was disappointing. Um, I mean, we got to a playoff in 2008 for the Euros, the 2009 Euros. So um, I suppose that was um, at the time I was still very young. And when you're when you're into the squad, I think um, as a newbie as such, maybe you don't, um, you know, you're just it's fearlessness, I suppose, in a way that you just don't realize the enormity of the task and how close we really were. Um, you know, we played Iceland over two legs and I still remember it we played them on a frozen pitch in the second leg and you'd always wonder what might have been but um yeah I mean it's obviously um disappointing but I think I think it's just I think the whole country is behind them at this stage we just want you know it's like a monkey in the back really just to get I think um you know hopefully once qualification seal for a first tournament that hopefully that can um you know set the ball rolling and um, you know, you would hope that it would become the norm then that we would be at, um, you know, if not World Cups, at least at the Euros. Like, I don't see any reason why, you know, that we shouldn't really um, be be competing at the Euros. And yeah, it would be just fantastic um, to be able to, to say that, um, you know, they got there at senior level, you know, having done it at underage level. Um, a lot of the girls, they have that experience now and I'm sure they really just want, want to get to the first senior tournament. Uh, in your time as an international, I suppose the scene has changed a little bit. Uh, the setting has changed. I remember international games been held maybe in Belfield Park as it was back in the day, or or in Richmond Park going to games there, and you knew everybody in the ground. There might have been uh, friends and family, parents, siblings of of the players, 
and maybe about a couple of dozen people involved with the game from clubs around the country. That was really it. There might be 150 people at the game total. Uh, now you're looking at like having half attendances or three quarters attendances in Tallah Stadium with with thousands. Now, obviously not right now with COVID, but before COVID, it had got to the stage where you had to have tickets because they were selling out or you had to buy your tickets. They couldn't give them away 15 years ago. How, mm. how, how nice was it to be part of that team through that kind of growth of the sport at international level in the country? Yeah, it was fantastic really to see the, the progression. Like you said, I mean, at the start, there was little or no um, publicity at all. And in fairness, Steph's goal, I think, really changed the game um, with regard to that in terms of people knew that there was now a women's uh, like soccer team, you know, wasn't... Uh, for the national team, I mean, obviously, like it wasn't really talked about much before that, to be honest, and it really did uh, change the whole landscape. And then, you know, a bit more media attention. And then when, uh, you know, people like obviously the 2020 campaign um, was saying it that if you can't see it, you can't be it. Like it's like that. It's just a matter of putting it out there for people. And I think um, it was really great to see the progression. And it's a pity in a way, obviously, with the timing of COVID that I think the um, the senior team was gaining a lot of momentum on media publicity and obviously COVID had put a slight halt to that. But, you know, I think you um, can look at it at other opportunities as well or other, you know, use it as, um, you know, as um, I suppose a good good thing as well in that more of the games now can be streamed, particularly like the, the women's um, National League, you know, been streamed. There's a lot more people actually watching the games than maybe, than maybe actually would go in person and um you know a knock-on effect of that is once they've seen it um online they might be more likely to go go themselves in person so um yeah it's definitely um moving in the right direction for sure yeah i saw dlr today posted a, a photograph of a, a five-year-old wearing their kit out just running around the pitches in belfield and it's so nice to see that young child effectively who's probably not even at school yet um already kind of maybe in her head somewhere there's a thought that maybe she can be what her brother could potentially be and and whereas little boys have always grown up with that dream it's great to see the kind of girls coming in with that and and looking up to players like yourself and steph and others uh, across the league and every single gir- girl who plays in the league is a role model to somebody so uh, fantastic That's it. Like, that um, i mean for myself even when i was growing up i didn't even know um the irish team like existed to be honest until i was getting trials and then i didn't know any of the players until I was meeting them at the first training session, you know, so I think, um, yeah, even like a local level with Galway and, you know, we have often have uh, mascots, obviously pre-COVID, coming to Eamon DC Park and, you know, then they get to experience that and like that, they see then, you know, they see the players playing, be it at club level or at international level, and then at least they have something to aspire to. So, um, yeah, it's great, really. What are your own highlights from the your time, whether it's at Galway? And obviously, we haven't even touched at your international club career. Obviously, you've played in Norway, Sweden, a bit in the States as well. Um, what are the highlights when you look back on the career? Not saying you've retired. I'm not saying that by any stretch. But uh, so far, what's the, the highlights for you? Uh, I would definitely say the FAI Cup with Galway um, in 2007. That definitely stands out because it was uh, just a really great time. I was... Uh, so young at the time, but it was just amazing. And um, there was a lot of quality players on our team, and um, you know, we really just um, we really bonded that year. And we always talk about it, even now when we meet up. We're like, oh, if you remember that time, and we brought the cup on a tour of Galway for for the next year. I'd say um, it visited every place um, that could be visited around Galway. So um, yeah, that definitely uh, stands out. But just I suppose the various experience that I got to have like even uh, I loved my time in America and in both Norway and Sweden as well like it was um it was just great to um I suppose experience different cultures and then um be able to then bring it back as well and um, bring the experience with me um you know at home and I can't let you go we had Neve Reed Burke on the show last week and obviously <laughs> <laughs> battled on many pitches together over the years but in terms of I suppose that particular incident and you know exactly what's coming because we're talking <laughs> about it off air um, talk us through that incident uh, where I'm of course referring to uh, a game against the world champions the USA in their own backyard in San Jose in California back in 2015 um, Neve, a novice hasn't really had that much experience at senior international level uh, you're in the defence right in front of her um, what's your memory or has it has anything stuck in because of the impact of the ball? You might tell us about the, the story. Um, yeah, so I was just on the back post from a corner. I think, I mean, I, 
majority of people would have seen the incident at this stage. But um, yeah, Rusha Little John, our own player, obviously, uh, the ball just uh, ricocheted off her shin, uh, right smack bang into my face, and uh, I went down on the ground. So. Um, you know, she does slag me sometimes saying that she just wants to score in front of 20,000 people and I stopped her from doing it. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously it stands out. And then Neve, um, you know, as she was diving, she saw the impact and um, I think she had just momentarily stopped playing and then uh, won back uh, for the US, just still kick the ball in the net. So I didn't even prevent a goal after all that. <laughs> well, you did prevent the first goal, not the second yeah. one. Uh, but I suppose having Neve Reid work and Carly Lloyd coming over to you to make sure you're okay while the game is progressing and you're conceding a goal is a little bit of a, a sympathy uh, card <laughs> at the end of it all. Um, Maeve, we're going to move on to maybe the interviews. And of course, um, you've been with us today, but you weren't with us when we were having the interviews earlier in the week. We had a chat with our next two guests. And the first of those is a former Women's National League player who featured with Castlebar Celtic back at the first season of the league. She's joining us now to talk about her career playing for Dublin GAA, getting to All-Ireland Finals, but also her professional career as a member of the Irish Women's Rugby 7 squad. And that's Kim Flood, who has signed for Wexford Youths in the league this year. Uh, here's the chat I had with her earlier in the week. Now, one new arrival down in Ferry Carrick Park this season is former rugby international Kim Flood. Herself, no stranger to the league. She's been involved with Castle Bar in the past during her time studying in IT Sligo. Kim joins us now for a chat. Kim, you're very welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Brefney. Thanks for having me on. You're more than welcome. It's been, I suppose, nice to see your name back on a Women's National League team sheet at the moment. We haven't seen you on the pitch yet, but I'm sure that's going to uh, come. How has the experience of being back in the league been for you for the last couple of weeks and months of pre-season and the first couple of rounds of games? Yeah, I suppose I fell into Exeter really, to be honest. Uh, it was probably one of the most positives that came out of COVID for me. Uh, I had no real intention of going back and, and actually playing at elite sport. Um, or even trying to throw my hand back at the, the Women's National League in soccer. Um, I was happy out playing uh, locally for a year um, with uh, St. Patrick's CY down at Ring's End. They started up a new a new team um, in kind of, you know, the EWFL League. Um, and I would have been playing football with Clonic Gale and I was actually doing a bit of rolling. So I had loads of sports going on. And then obviously COVID came um, and kind of took that all away. Um, so obviously you had to be elite to be able to train. And I was kind of at a loose end. I was so used to doing everything any sport um, and always been involved in a team and being around people so COVID kind of came and I kind of panicked when my football team I suppose couldn't train anymore or play and I was like oh you know um, what can I do here what can I do here and I just I, I actually reached out to one of the girls that I knew was playing with Wexford at the time and they were still training at the tail end of the season last year just before Christmas because uh, their one obviously you know, ran on quite late in the year um, so just before Christmas there, I got on to my friend Sinead Taylor and asked, you know, would the coach mind me coming in, maybe training with them just to keep the fitness up and that. Um, and he actually had no problem. Tom, to be fair to him, allowed me to come in and train away uh, at the tail end. I think they had maybe two or three games left to finish out. Um, so that was good, you know, to get back into it and get to that level. Uh, the first training session going up. Uh, to Carlo where they train uh, was was tough, you know, but I actually really, really enjoyed it. Um, you know, fitness level, obviously, it's quite high and uh, technically, like skill-wise, the players are, you know, they're, they're in the tail end of a season, so they're absolutely flying along or whatever. They're nearly starting to wind down, come out of a season. So uh, it was great to get in with them before the Christmas um, with level five. Obviously, restrictions then continued into January. And again, my team weren't going to back because I think we, we could only play games in level two last year. Um, and it was the first time I kind of played, played soccer in a long, long time since maybe Castlebar in 2013. Um, so it kind of gave me that taste for soccer. That actually, you know, I'm really enjoying this. Like, I, I actually love love playing so soccer. And I was playing with all my friends, like, locally. And it was a new team. And I knew the coach. I played with her, uh, Rachel McGuinness. So she's a super player. Um, so it was actually... That gave me the taste of soccer. And then when I went and played with or trained with uh, Wexford for the few weeks before they finished up um, and level five continued, I, I asked, could I stay on with Wexford and, and go in and train with them again and kind of see where the restrictions led us. Um, and 
it just it didn't look like it was going to get lifted and the only sport that was going ahead was elite and the women's national league is classified as being elite level uh, league of ireland so um you know i was doing okay in training uh getting on you know well uh, with the players and stuff like that they're very welcoming um and tom actually asked me you know would i consider maybe staying on and signing for the season it was a tough one because uh, I was the captain of the new team down in my local area and they were trying to get up and running and I, and I know how hard that is to keep uh, keep that going. So that was really important to me. I really did think about it, you know, kind of, you know, we even have a chance maybe actually breaking into this Wexford side. Can I get back to that level again? Um, you know, I was doing quite well at training with them and I really enjoyed training with them. The girls were brilliant, um, lovely bunch of girls to be fair. Uh, but I did consider the team that I was captain at the time, and and that was a hard and difficult decision. Um, but I couldn't see how the restrictions down, lifting. How yeah. did that go down when you broke the news to the the girls in Ringsend? Yeah, like it was it was tough. I'd spoken to the manager Rachel, obviously on and off. She knew I was going training. She knows that I like you know like to have a structure, like to keep kind of as fit as I can. Um, so she knew I was training with them. I was very open in terms of communication. Uh, with Rachel and Anthony and with CY and I kind of told her okay I've been asked to stay on as I now I think she felt that it was going to happen anyway Um, and you know I I said to her look I I don't see the restrictions maybe lifting to allow our team to get back uh, for a long while I might just give this year give a season at least to to Wexford and see how I go and just dive into it and see where it takes me you know it's been a long time I, I i don't have much expectations in terms of um you know being one of the best players on the extra team you know they're one they're one of the best teams in the league and um, and they have quality all over the pitch um but i am competitive briefly so if i'm signing up i'm, I'm diving into a full-on and i i want to compete and i want to play um I understand the level I need to get at and I think I can um, and I have been proving myself in training and, and, and going well, uh, trying to understand the way that Tom likes to play and um, systems he likes to use. Um, but at the same time, the girls are solid and playing centre half at the moment. Um, and you have Lauren Dwyer and Orla Conlon um, who are currently in those positions and, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're not shy of the, the Irish side either underage and even at senior level. So it is tough to break in uh, to, to those positions, but um, I, I'll certainly give them a good run. I'd be on their heels every chance. <laughs> Um, really, and I, suppose I probably did you a disservice in the introduction because not only are you a rugby international and a, a former uh, FAI Cup finalist, you've also played in Crow Park on All-Ireland Final Day with the with the Dubs as well, uh, a proud Clonagh Gale woman as well over the years. And you've been, I suppose, there thereabouts in, in Dublin sport over the last, I suppose, what, decade really, probably a little bit more even. And um, what's it been like, I suppose, taking that step out of the, the per, almost that professional attitude in the rugby union and, and going back down to play with the likes of Pat CY over the last season or so? Yeah, I was with um, the Irish international side. I was contracted uh, sense player um, and I had the opportunity a couple of times to cross over into the 15 squad to play in the Six Nations um, for about three or four seasons. I picked up a, a pretty bad injury. I had a spinal operation, which allowed like which basically I couldn't continue in the sport um it wouldn't have been good kind of with the with the levels of contact and stuff like that um so I kind of I suppose stopped playing rugby and I was kind of looking for other avenues where I could probably get back and I was just basically happy to play any sport at any level at that stage um you know when you get a a serious enough injury you're just you're just mad to get back playing but um, in terms of the Irish and the rugby side of things, that, that wasn't going to be for me. Um, when I had the operation, I, I just wouldn't have been able to get back to the level. And then um, the risk of anything reoccurring again um, was just too high. So, yeah, it, it was tough coming out of that bubble because I had done it for so long. It was a job. You know, I got to travel the world, uh, see so many places, play against so many different teams. Uh, amazing athletes um, and play alongside them as well um, you know I played with my sister Stacey uh, who won her first cap at the 15s team 
on Saturday uh, at out half. It would have been great if I could hold on and uh, get a half with her at the same time for 15s like we did for sevens. But um, it wasn't to be. Look, we were so proud of the family. Like to have two people in the family that have um, represented Ireland is just amazing. Um, my family are sports mad like every one of them. Uh, we used to all play Gaelic together, the four girls. And the two two boys played uh, Gaelic and soccer, and Mark would have played rugby as well to a fairly high level at schools, Leinster rugby. So we're just sport mad, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, ha- haven't played all three codes to the highest level possible, really, on on this island. <clears throat> what's your What's your thoughts? Maybe we've had a lot of girls on the show in the last couple of weeks who played one or two or three sports and. And that's a kind of a more growing thing as opportunities become available to girls around the country. What's your own opinion in terms of to decide on when to specialise in those? Because you've managed to kind of dip in and out of all three of them at various stages at club and country over the over the years. Yeah, jack of, jack of all trades, master of none. Well, um, sure. no, to be honest, yeah, I would have. Uh, look, growing up, I grew up in Rings End. I used to play soccer with the boys, Cambridge Football Club. And... Um, I loved it. I used to play with them in the park all the time. Uh, jumpers for goalposts. I was probably the only girl playing. I was definitely the only girl on the team at the time with Cambridge. I mean, you reach a certain level, like Steph and a lot of girls my age would have had to leave the boys team. And there was no girls locally for me, which brings me back to the reason why it's so important that CY continues down locally because I was that kid that had no team locally. You know, my... My family, like we, there's six of us in my family and we were all kind of similar ages and we were quite young to be driven to Crumlin, maybe United to play. It was just that bit too far and it was a big commitment. So I was actually going really well in primary school and I got into Gaelic football that way. And then I started moving up the ranks with Dublin. So I'd kind of left then soccer, you know, that had kind of gone then and I was really progressing in, in Gaelic football. I was getting onto the Dublin minor teams, Dublin senior teams for years and uh, done really well with the minors played midfield and then broke into the senior team as well and was with them and it was only I only kind of fell into rugby by chance because um like Gaelic would have been probably my number one sport like um definitely uh really enjoyed playing with Dublin and with with my club as well uh for years the last time I represented Dublin was in the 2015 All-Ireland final and uh, it just I, I fell into rugby by chance because I think it was in 2014 or 13, we'd lost the Kerry in the court final of the All-Ireland. So we kind of finished up that bit earlier than usual during the summer. Um, I was kind of at a loose end and there was a team railway union setting up um, in Sandy Mount, a new team. Um, so I was like, you know, before I go back to college, because I had nothing to do because Dublin finished up sooner than we should have, you know, like we'd expect to make a semi-final at least in an All-Ireland series. Um, so I went down to railway with one of my friends and just tried to keep fit. Like we're like we go see what this is about, you know. Um, you know we got on quite well. Um, I'd never thrown a rugby ball before. I never really thought of even trying to play. Um, and next thing I, I was getting fast tracked into getting playing with Leinster and getting trials and I, I actually didn't even understand the game and I was moving so quickly in it, uh, getting these opportunities. So that's kind of how I got pulled across then into the rugby scene. And I was still kind of, God, am I even good at this? And I was playing Leinster and then, you know, uh, then I was going back and playing Gaelic. And, uh, you know, I finished up then in 2015 and Anthony Eddy, the, the sevens coach, the high performance director for women's rugby, approached me um, about coming into the sevens set up, you know, after the All-Ireland final, you know. So it was tough to leave Dublin because we lost that year uh, to Cork and we were so close. And I remember, like, you know, as a kid, all I ever wanted to do was win an Ireland. And any of the teams I was on, I always won a runner-up medal. I missed out in 2010 um, to the winner the, when when the girls actually did win. I played in 2009, so it's kind of always that year out um, where they won in 2014. Like, did they win in 2014? I think they did. I was away traveling in the States, playing Gaelic over there with Nafina. So I always kind of missed out on what I really wanted to achieve, which was a winner, a winner's All-Ireland medal with Dublin football. Um, and I I took the decision to actually, you know what, I go across into rugby, I'll give this a go, see where I can go. I knew my sister was already in the seven set up. And um, I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll try my hand at this and see see how I get on. 
you know, I've been playing little bits with Railway and doing a couple of sevens tournaments as well with Railway Union and stuff like that. And, you know, I was starting to pick up the skills a bit better and learn the game. Um, and then obviously my athletic ability, my Gaelic background, soccer background, you know, kind of that helped me then as well in terms of the pass and, you know, kicking. Obviously the ball is a different shape and you have to treat it differently. But um, I, I just seen the opportunity then to, to play with my sister, represent Ireland, wear that green jersey and see where it took me. And it took me around the world at least three times and um, traveling. So I am so grateful for the opportunity and to do it with the little sister as well. It's brilliant. Absolutely, and I suppose uh, I was coaching Railway Union under third, under fourteen or fifteen boys at the time that year. So we used to see uh, trainers on the other side of the field. It was it's great to watch the enthusiasm that came out of that particular club. And I think I look now at some of the new teams in the women's national league uh, coming out, and they have that same kind of enthusiasm with a couple of people really pushing it on off the pitch. Um, and I know there was a really good team on and off the pitch in Railway at the, at the time, and. From, from nothing to be kind of national champions in about, I think it was about 12 or 18 months, you just came out of nowhere. It was absolutely phenomenal to watch it. Uh, in terms of, I suppose, the, where the future is for yourself over the next couple of months with Wexford, um, how soon before we maybe see on the pitch or is that kind of at the whim of, of the manager at this point in time? Yeah, look, Tom has been really good, uh, very supportive to me. Um, he, knows, he knows my background. He knows I haven't been in soccer for a long time. Um, you know, I'm progressing well. I'm starting to get I'm starting to get back into it now, really get the touch back, you know, get the understanding, uh, the type of play that he, he wants us to try and play as well and implement. Um, so it's been really positive. Like, you know, the girls are, are brilliant in terms of getting uh, getting a run. It's a long L season. You know, the girl, we only had two games. I suppose we wouldn't we wouldn't have started as well as we would have liked. Some of the some of the performance have been brilliant. I thought we played really good against Piemont. Um you know, we're disappointing enough result against uh, DLR, but to be fair to DLR, you know, they've strengthened their side and they did well to hold out, I suppose, in terms of that game in the second match. And then next week we're going in and playing Treaty. So I think there will be rotations. It's a very long season, Brefney, to be honest. Uh, I couldn't believe when I seen that it goes on till November. Um, so look, I'd say there will be rotations. He'll give opportunity. Uh, he might look at different systems, um, different girls in different positions and stuff like that. So... Uh, there's a good core group. There's a good mix of, of youth and experience there, um, you know, and to get to get to play alongside some of the girls, you know, some unbelievable players down there. Um, and they'll definitely be pushing to, uh, you know, t to get that league title back and get into as many cup finals as possible. You know, that's the aim. But uh, yeah, I'll be pushing to try and get the spot. Um, hopefully soon. I should. I should hopefully get my opportunity soon. Um, so we're just about grabbing it with two hands and um, trying to stick to the game plan that Tom uh, wants us to execute on the day against the team, whichever team that is. Well, as you said yourself, super competitive athlete over the years on so many different levels. You're in a very, very small, uh, unique kind of club. Players who've played in FAI Cup finals, All Ireland finals, and played for Ireland in an international level. The only other person I can think who possibly ticks those boxes is maybe Nora Stapleton, potentially. Um, possibly Hannah Tyrrell as well, but I'm not sure whether she ever made the FAI Cup final. But no, it, it's it's a very, very small select group of people. So uh, thanks for joining us. And the very, very best luck to you and the your team in Wexford over the season ahead. Yeah, thanks very much for having me, Rafferty. Well, rugby and Gaelic football's loss is most definitely Wexford Youth's gain. Kim Flood there. Um, I told her she was in a, a fairly small club, but I mean, if you have two of those three ticked off yourself, played in the FAI Cup final, uh, you've also played on Incro Park on all Ireland final day, but not for Galway. No, we're right. Uh, yeah, I ended up playing for New York in 2011 uh, when I lived over there for a few years. Uh, they put together the county team over there. We travelled home then. For matches, uh, it was great experience at the time. We, I think, we travelled home for a quarter final and a semi final on on one flight, and then a few weeks later we came back for the final. But unfortunately, the final uh, ended in a draw, and we were getting ready for extra time. But uh, at that time, there's precedent that the All Ireland final never goes to extra time, even if you live three thousand miles away. So we had to come back and uh, play the replay. Um, I think the following week or, the week or two weeks later it was at the time actually, um, but unfortunately we lost to Wicklow, but it was an uh, amazing experience, like you said, to play in Pro Park and all, all Ireland final day was pretty special. That just sounds expensive. 
to come back <laughs> for a replay. Um, obviously, you have never played rugby for Ireland, though, so we can't let you into the, that complete triumvirate club, but you're, you have two boxes ticked. It's not bad. Not That's bad. it, yeah. In fairness, uh, Kim has, has them all ticked there. It's great to see her back. Um, you know, Did you ever play with Kim? Because I know you would have played with a lot of the same players. You at Galway, maybe a year or two after she uh, played with Castlebar. Yeah, I don't think uh, can't recall we have um, you know uh, played on the same pitch, but uh, not not directly, anyways. But uh, it is it's great to see her back um, with Wexford playing at this level. Like um, you know, particularly after like said like she mentioned there that she had to um, you know her rugby career has ended because injury is really it's fantastic to see her back on a pitch of some sort. And now a story that was brought to our attention over the course of the last week or so. We were contacted by friends of Sonia Hoy from Dundalk Women's FC, a former player in the squad that reached the 2004 and 2005 FAI Cup finals. Sonia scored the winner in the 2005 final, but recently received some bad news. Her friend and former teammate Emma Singleton joins us now to talk about all that she's going through in her life and how maybe the women's football community in the country can rally behind and help her get life-saving treatments. Now, one story that's caught our attention over the last week or so has been the Save Our Sonia campaign, and that is an initiative been created in Dundalk to support Sonia Hoy, a former Dundalk FC and Piedmont United player, also a member of numerous Louth GAA club and county teams over the years and I'm joined by Emma Singleton to talk about Sonia and about the impact she had in football in Dundalk maybe pre-Women's National League days um, over the last I suppose two decades or so. Emma you're very welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much for having me, thanks for having me. Now obviously I've had the pleasure of coaching you before with the Leinster College's side at uh, a little bit after Sonia herself was in that team as well, back in the early part of the noughties, back around 2003 or 2004, um, Sonia would have been involved in that team as well. And uh, a lovely girl, fantastic player, scored the winner in the 2005 FAI Cup Final, which made up for the defeat in the 2004 FAI Cup Final. Um, how important, well, first of all, maybe before we get into her, her football bona fides, tell us a little bit about what she's going through at the moment. Um, so Sonia, like you said, um, she's a past uh, soccer player, Gaelic player, runner. She's she probably threw her hand at everything. Um, she's only forty two years of age, and in two thousand and nineteen, she was diagnosed with stage four cervical cancer. And being the fighter that she is, she fought through. She went into remission, but unfortunately, this year we found out um, it's the cancer has come back, and it's now in her lungs. Um, so because she had such aggressive chemotherapy and radiotherapy treatment here in Ireland, the only other care they can offer her now is palliative care. And like I said, because she's such a fighter, she never die attitude. She's always had on and off the pitch. That's not good enough for Sonia. It's not good for good enough for us or our family. So um, we're hoping to get her over to Mexico. And um, I think it's hope for cancer treatment. The place is called um, to give her a new and alternative treatment to hopefully prolong and like inevitably help save her life um because that's basically what she deserves now i suppose it's a it's a horrible situation for any family or any individual to find themselves in um what has what has happened so far because you launched this campaign maybe a week to 10 days ago the response has been pretty phenomenal incredible i i keep saying it to her like this is the running joke i has to be a record like in the space of less than 24 hours when that GoFundMe uh, got put up, there was 60 grand raised. And I, like, obviously I've, I'm from Dublin myself, but I've lots of friends in Dublin, lots of friends in Dock and like nationwide, like anybody else. But I've never seen such a big response so quickly. And I think that just speaks volumes to how highly people hold Sonia in regard, like how fond people are of her, what she means to people, what impact she's had. It's, it's been really, really phenomenal. Yeah, and of course, um, you played with her at Dundalk. Maybe tell us a little bit about how important she was to the, the lifeblood of women's football in the town. Um, to be honest, I genuinely think, like, uh, Sonia's 10 years older than I am. She'll kill me now for saying that. But um, she, like, I used to actually play against Sonia. I used to play for Temple Oak in Dublin. She used to play for Dundalk. And I remember, like, I was a centre-half. She was obviously a forward. 
And I used to dread the day that we'd have to play Dundalk because I knew I was going to have to mark Sonic. The, the forward, she'd always get a goal, guaranteed at least one or two goals every match. But like in my opinion, and lots of like girls around Loud, uh, Dundalk in particular, she was genuinely like a pioneer for women in sport, like long before it was even an initiative, long before the 2020 campaign. You know, like she was always fighting for equal rights. She was always really professional, you know, like, she had so many different roles on the day of a match. Like, you know, she might be physio, helping someone do stretches, helping someone tape something up. She'd be your kind of coach on the pitch, you know, like she would always have positive criticism to tell you. And in such a, like her own way, it was never negative. That Like you, she always got the best of everyone in her own way, you know, and you just knew when she was on the pitch, she was going to have an impact. It, she was just an amazing player and an amazing girl. Yeah, I suppose that 2005 final, 1-0 against Piemont, you want to play for Piemont for a season or two because I know Dundalk went through some political issues and the club split in two and there was a whole lot of things going on there. We're not going to get into all of that stuff today. Uh, but in terms of, I suppose, she always just wanted to play. And anytime I either had her on a team or was facing her against her, you always had to make a plan to deal with her um, because she was such a threat going forward. i we saying this in the past tense. She's still with us, thank God. Um, but it, it was... It was she was always someone you had to take uh, into account when you were preparing a game plan. Oh, absolutely. And you know, I know from talking to managers, like I was lucky enough to play against her or play with her, like on numerous teams over the years. And I know for a fact that managers would put Sonia Hoy down on the team sheet first, and then you'd plan your team around her. Um, so the same for someone trying to counteract her, like, and sometimes like. You know, I'd be thinking, I'm, I'm taller than her, I'm stronger than her, but she'd still find a way to get around you. She'd still find the back of the net. You know, she's just really, really talented. But it was all hard work. Like, she never missed a training session. She always went out on extra. You know, like I said, she was a professional before that was even a thing. And it just shows, like, she had such an impact on so many young girls growing up. Um, and still to this day, you know, like, getting people involved in soccer, getting them involved in sports. So... That's obviously why the response has been so great and like thankfully so. How is she now? Because I know you're in, in regular contact with her all the time. How is she coping? Yeah, she's good. Like, you know yourself what she's like. Um, she she's always smiling, cracking the jokes. You know, I think the last time we seen her was maybe November, like kind of social distance but face to face. Um, otherwise it's just been Zooms. But um, no, she's good. Like she she's always been a trooper and she always had that never say, say die attitude but on and off the pitch so um it really stands to her you know but thankfully she's in good form like excellent in terms of i suppose uh the success that dundalk has had we're very used to t- talking about dundalk dundalk in terms of having success um at national level on the boys side of the house over the last maybe decade or so particularly the last maybe seven or eight years in terms of i suppose dundalk with the only team in town the women's side with the only team in town through the noughties and a lot of that down to not just her on the field play but she was so integral to what was happening off the pitch as well in terms of, as you said, bringing girls in and making sure they're part of the team, making sure that they're, they're available, making sure they want to sign. And like Dundalk really came almost out of nowhere to win that cup in 2005. Um, how much, I suppose, of, of a, of, of a loss will, is, is she in just in the fact that she's unavailable for the last couple of years because of illness to the sport in the town? Oh, massive. Like I said, like I was lucky enough to play soccer and Gaelic with her. Um, and, you know, for years we were like, ah, Sonia, you know, don't be retiring yet. What are you on about? You don't need to retire yet. And like, she had lots of injuries too. Like she broke her collarbone twice. Like she had to get surgery on her ankles a couple of times. Um, from all the bad tackles and hold my hand up, I'm probably responsible for half of them. Um, but like, so we were like, please, you know, please don't retire because you knew it was going to be such a big loss. And I think the fact that so many people knew her, like she was genuinely the fittest, one of the healthiest girls on the team. And I think the fact that so many people remember her like that, that now they've seen that she's going through all of this, it's been such a massive shock. You would never expect it to happen to someone like Sonia. So I think that's why the response has been so great also. For someone who hasn't been made aware of this, and we have a small audience here in the Women's National League um, grouping that might not have seen this um, outside of maybe the Dundalk environment, 
what, how can they help? How can they get on board? Because I know you've exceeded the goal, but every little helps. I suppose I, I come from a family that's been very fortunate to have had this type of support for a member of my family who needed it when it happened. And it, like no amount of money is ever enough in these environments because there's things that they haven't even thought about yet that are required um, for whatever may be down the road and who really knows. And how can people get involved? How can they support? How can they open their wallets and maybe uh, donate something to the cause? Uh, yeah, so like you said, there's lots of different costs that like will will come up in the future. So like we're saying, it, it's 80 grand to get Sonia to Mexico for this treatment, but then she will have to go back in maybe a month, two months afterwards to have a follow up. And um, so again, it cost, that's going to cost a lot of money. Then there's, you know, flights, accommodation, um, you know, medicine, all the all the kind of things you don't really think of, like you were saying. So. We have four fundraisers going at the moment. So originally it was the um, 80K we needed. So we signed up. Um, it's a relay we're doing from Dublin to, or sorry, from Ireland to Mexico. So I think it's like 8,000, 8,500 kilometers. Um, so we're trying to sign as many people up as we can to do 80 kilometers each. It's 20 euro to sign up. You just sign up through the GoFundMe. Send your screenshots of your acti activity in. And we're all going to show Sonia that we're literally every step of the way by trying to do it as many kilometers for her as we can. Um, there's also, um, I know there's going to be a Zoom. It's um, a charity kind of quiz night she's having. Um, she told me four things. She's going to kill me. Um, there's also a Save Our Sonia game. Yeah, sorry? The Dundalk Draw It Again. The Dundalk Draw It Again. Yes, I knew that was a big one. So it's um, they're trying to break the attendance record. So I think previously it was um, 8,000. They're trying to break that and get as many people watching it as possible. So to stream it, it's five euro a ticket. Um, you can just buy that through the Dundalk FC shop. Um, five euro a ticket. Uh, like it's really not that much. Like a coffee costs five euro, if you think about it. And um, I think, yeah, so that's the three big ones. The GoFundMe and we have a Save Our Sonia page. So I think at the moment that's starting to trend. So if you even put that into Google or Facebook, that should come up. But the GoFundMe, the draw to the dark match and the relay as well. And um, we're going to have a lot of raffles too coming up that people can get involved in. And a quiz night that you mentioned as well. We better get them all quiz in. Night, yeah. get, you'll be the one on the chopping block. <laughs> I, know, I knew I shouldn't have been sent to this. And listen, Emma, thanks so much for joining us. Obviously, a, a former player yourself with, with Dundalk and, and Temple Oak, as you mentioned, now currently um, fighting the good fight along with your former teammate, Sonia Hoy. And I suppose it's it's great to see the support that's been there for her in what can only be described as a horrendous situation for anybody to find themselves in. And our thoughts, and I'm sure the thoughts of everybody in the Women's National League community are with her, her family, her friends, and her former teammates as well who are going through this with her. So thank you very much for joining us. And we wish you and Sonia and everybody involved the best of luck. Thanks very much, Bethany. Now, of course, we do have a small matter of the Women's National League. It is the Women's National League podcast. And we haven't done much talking with the league today on the show. But in terms of this weekend, we're back in action. International break done and dusted. And we have four games to look at this weekend. Let's start maybe with your own uh, former side, Galway Women's FC. They make the trip to UCD to take on the DOR Waves. Ironically enough, the reverse of the fixture where we first crossed paths uh, 15 years ago, Maeve, in a FAI Women's Senior Cup semi-final. Um, do you think it's going to go UCD's way or DLR's way this this time as well? Or do you think Galway will be <laughs> Thanks for reminding me of that. Um, very you cold day. Know, yeah. Cold day in um, her view that day. But uh, luckily we, we came good the following year. Uh, yeah, obviously I'm I'm going to be hoping for a Galway win uh, this weekend. Um, I think though it's going to be a really close game. Um, what's kind of exciting about the fixture is this time around. I think the teams that are playing each other are all uh, quite close in the table. You know, um, particularly this game. Um, you know, and Peace and Shell stands out as well. But um, I think like I was, I was saying, both Galway and DLR are going to try. Um, they've made it known before the season started that one of their goals is try to break in and make that top three or top four. And um, you know, hopefully, hopefully it'll be Galway's year to do that. But um, UCD or sorry, DLR are uh, you know they're a very good side. They brought in a lot of changes, um, and they have you know I think they'll be it'll be a tough game. Um, the weekend obviously Galway are going to be without Chloe Singleton through suspension, so I think she'll be a big loss. But um, they've plenty of players as well, depth in, in the squad to be able to 
kind of should get through the game hopefully uh, without her. What did you make of that sending off? Because it seemed very light to me. Yeah, I actually, um, I suppose I'm not, not too sure because um, I was only watching it online. I wasn't there um, in person, so I, I'm not sure what was, um, you know, what exactly happened. But um, yeah, I thought the second yellow was quite um, quite light, but um, I'm not sure if any words were exchanged or that between um, the referee and Chloe. I, I don't know. So um, I suppose I can't argue with the referee's um, decision, <laughs> even though I have in the past. <laughs> Really? You, that's all I can call, babe. <laughs> and, uh, time. Not many. I, I never got a red, though. <laughs> so I'll, I'll keep that record. <laughs> uh, you did mention Pease and Shelburne. They play on Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening as well, out in Green Oak. Um, it's a very early indication of maybe where these two sides are at. Both teams, 100% records so far. But Shelburne have been really impressive, particularly attacking. They just seem to have been knocking teams, uh, goals past teams for fun. Um, P-Mount, a little bit more reserved, although maybe the standard of the team they played in, in down in, in Wexford was just that slight bit higher than maybe Shells have played so far. But it's going to be a cracker. Yeah, it really is. It's the standout game of the weekend. I think, um, you know, it's the first real um, um, test, I suppose, between the top three and um, both teams. Like you said, they've had good starts to the season. Shells are always a really, um, you know, potent attacking force. And this year is no different. Like, they're really they're stacked with quality going forward. So uh, I would expect to see a few goals. And obviously, P-Mount, um, their record speaks for themselves. Um, I'll have to back step on this one. I think P-Mount, uh, you know, will do well this weekend. Um, but I think, you know, I think they really, um, P-Mount have experience as well of winning and closing out games when they need to. So I think they have a lot of, um, you know, game management, um, the game management necessary to, to win as well. So I think it's going to be a very tight game. It's a difficult one to call, to be honest. Um, but I think it's going to, you know, set the marker down um, for the season and whichever team, if, if either comes out with um, three points, then it'd be a huge boost to, to their, um, you know, title hopes. Who's under more pressure going into this? Because obviously Piedmont, uh, they shaded this fixture last year in terms of, you know, there was a big win in the cup and then there was the, the league decider towards the end of the season as well. In terms of the investment that seems to have been put in um, from Shelburne in terms of resources, I don't mean financial resources, but I mean in terms of the players that they've brought in, the management change that they've done, do they really have to step up and, and show that they've, those changes have bridged that gap or even put them ahead of Piedmont. Is there more pressure on Noel King than maybe on the Piedmont target? Yeah, uh, it's hard to, to know. You know, I suppose generally you'd say that because Piedmont are the double winners from last year and the reigning uh, champions, that they would be under the most pressure. But like you alluded to there, Shells have really put a lot of, um, into the team this year. Um, back in the day I played under Noel, he was a great manager. So I've no doubt that he's going to bring in lots of good changes um, to the Shells team that we just maybe haven't seen um, seen yet. But yeah, I suppose I, I, I'd imagine both um, both teams would have their own internal pressure as well that they would, you know, be expecting. Um, obviously, both of them are, um, their goal is to win the title. So um, I think the pressure that they put themselves under would probably be the most pressure. But um, in terms of, you know, expectation or that, um, I suppose it's, it's a bit of a 50-50 one in terms of um, who'd be the ones who'd be expected to win. Yeah, it is only the first of three, though, so there's no knockout blows going to be delivered this weekend. It might be like the men's side of things in the first division of the uh, Electricity League. It, it could be one of those kind of early chess moves, just see where you are, see where the opposition are, and, and make plans for, for attacking them later on in the league campaign. One other game on Saturday afternoon, that, of course, is the clash of Bohemians and Cork. Cork have only managed one point from their two games, but I've been very impressed with them. I don't know how much you saw of their game down in, in Galway, but their never say die attitude. Uh, they really could put it up to Bohemians, who have started a little bit brighter. Uh, that early day, or the opening day, six-goal haul against Treaty would have set them up nicely as well. I think that's going to be a pretty good game, albeit, as you mentioned, at that slightly lower level in the league, maybe that mid-table range. Yeah, um, obviously Galway have played both of the teams already, so I've watched um, watched the full games of those. And uh, Cork, like you said, that never never say die attitude has really stood to them um, in previous seasons as well. Um, you can just see their track record with the FAI Cup. Um, obviously unsuccessful last year, but previously being successful, it is um, a trait that they have. And, um, you know, they do bring it into every game. 
Um, unfortunately, from Galway side, um, on the first day of the season, it was it earned them a point up in um, in DC Park. But like you said, Bose were the surprise package on the first day for sure because no one maybe they did themselves, but I don't think um, the rest of the league expected them to score six goals um, in one game. You know, on the first on the first day of the season. Uh, but um, you know, then on the flip side, um, Galway Galway beat them the last time out. Um, but again, they were they were away to Galway as well. So. I think it's um you know it's going to be a f- pretty exciting game um from a neutral standpoint to see you know how are these teams you know going to fare like Cork um obviously have ambitions and hopes to get up to the higher end of the table as well so I think this is a game that they need to get three points in obviously there's no doubt about that if they are going to want to push on to the the upper end of the table. I suppose the the final game of the weekend on Sunday afternoon, Treaty United and Wexford. Wexford go into this game probably as hot favourites based on previous form. Um, I, I would have feared for Treaty when Athlone scored after the first round of defeat to Bowes. Athlone scored early the second round, and I feared for Treaty that it was going to be another whitewash and that it could actually cause a problem for them. But they rallied really, really well. They took a point out of that. It means that no team in the league is on zero points, which is kind of nice after two rounds, uh, that everyone's up and running and has something on the board. Um, can you see anything other than an away win in this game, though? Um, probably not, but at the same time, Treaty, uh, like Cork, they do have a lot of dogged determination Um you know, um, Mary Curtin things has gone in there this year as well, and she'll bring a lot of experience to them. And they're not going to, um, you know, lie down and just, um, you know, they're not there to, to make up the numbers um, as such. And like you said, to already have a point on the board for all the teams across the league, it's great because it, it is looking like it's going to be the most competitive league, um, most competitive season yet. And um, I think Treaty are going to, you know, they'll fancy their chances as well. Like they'll, they're going to put it up to Wexford, I think. But I think um, in terms of from our expert point of view, um, they do need to, they've had a disappointing start to the season. And if they're going to want to be up, um, you know, competing for the title, um, they they are definitely going to have to get a win um, against Treaty and off the weekend. Yeah, I think the pressure is all on them this weekend. I think Treaty will take a, a free shot and hope to maybe get a bit of a scalp uh, m- much the same way as they did when they went that goal down to Athlone uh, two weeks ago. Maeve, that's pretty much it for this week. Thank you very much um, for filling in for Steph and uh, regaling us all about your uh, your encounters with Neve Reed Burke and footballs from Marisha Little John Shins uh, back in uh, San Jose a couple of years ago now. And uh, wish you the best of luck wherever that might be, whether it's back in a Galway jersey in time or whether you go off gallivanting around the planet when all this madness ends in a couple of months, hopefully. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. Talk to you soon. No problem. And of course, from, from myself and Steph again next week, uh, everyone listening and watching, thank you very much. Don't forget to subscribe if you're watching here on YouTube or following us on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to have you around every week. Talk to you then. Thanks. <laughs>